Hello and welcome to DFS Coach Talk. It is Sunday, April 19th, 2020. I am Andrew Hansen, and I am very excited today because it's a beautiful day in the Northeast, 60 degrees and sunny. I'm on with my man, Brett Trimble. First chance we get to do a podcast together. We've got the the last dance starting up tonight, the Chicago Bulls documentary. All kinds of good stuff, Brett. So um, I know you're up in the Northeast as well in upstate New York. How are things over there? It's pretty nice up here. I mean, it's uh, it's a little cloudy, but I mean, the weather's nice. The temperature's good. I I really don't have any complaints up here. Yeah, that's about all you can ask for on a on a Sunday in April here in the Northeast is instead of the snow we had earlier in the weekend, get a ch- chance to get outside and not have to be in a winter coat. That's true. That's very true. It's uh, it was funny because uh, earlier in the week yeah, I remembered looking at my phone and seeing uh, it was snowing and then I look out the window and of course there's you know a sprinkle of dust on the ground and I'm like really it's April but <laughs> I know it <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah well that's just how it goes sometimes you know you just gotta exactly. wait for the good weather yes you do well there's somebody else on our team who's having an even better day weather wise and that's the birthday boy none other than our fearless leader Joe Sarvati affectionately known as coach so coach we want to wish you a happy birthday here on Sunday and hope you enjoy your day off from the podcasts. Um, You know, one of the first birthday presents that Brett and I are giving you is that I'm going to handle the Marlins so that you don't have to. And and Brett, I mean, we're going to let Brett have a little bit better assignment. He's got the Phillies um, because you're from Philly. Yes, sir. And let's be real. Philadelphia ain't much better than the Marlins at this point, based on what happened last year. (laughs) Yeah, what they were 500 exactly. Yeah. I mean, they do seem like they're trying to win a little bit more than the Marlins. Of course. Yeah, the Marlins are rebuilding, and Philadelphia just had some bad luck. So hopefully they turn it around. Absolutely. Well, uh, before I forget, I mentioned the the Last Dance, the big Bulls documentary starting tonight. And I can't wait for that. But there's one other NBA message I want to give, because I know a lot of our listeners are probably playing the NBA simulations on FanDuel. And I want to take a a second to mention the rules changes over there um, for our folks who are listening and and want to gain an edge in those fun free contests. So I don't know if you remember, Brett, but the about a week ago, all the NBA contests were based on the players game logs from this last season. Yes. And then and then middle of last week, one of our members, uh, Brenton, sent a message to the group and said, hey, did you notice how on FanDuel? All the players' stats have been wiped clean. Their pictures aren't even there anymore. And it looked like a, a change in the simulation. And so he asked about whether there had been any, any rule changes. And so I immediately went to FanDuel, pulled up the NBA simulation, looked at the rules, and they were the same. So I figured, okay, um, it looks different, uh, but the rules are going to be the same. They're still going to be based on the game logs from last year. But then a couple days ago, In one of our contests with our members, we had a couple guys play J.J. Redick, and he scored 52.3 fantasy points. And I knew something was wrong because I'd studied his game logs, and he didn't have any 52-point fantasy games this year. So I go back to FanDuel, pull up the NBA simulations, and lo and behold, there's a whole new set of rules. They've changed the entire format. So... I wanted to alert everybody to that. What they're doing now is they are using number fire and the number fire player rankings. And it's a little bit convoluted. What they're doing is they're matching up each NBA player with 25 other NBA players seasons in the last 20 years. And then they're randomly selecting one of those players performances to assign to the current NBA player. 
So, for example, that J.J. Redick game where he got 52 fantasy points a couple days ago, that wasn't his game. It was a game that Buddy Heald got on January 19th last year. So uh, it's a completely different calculus, and I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and then, so, Brett, if you if you get in the NBA contest tonight for DFS Coach Talk, I wanted to make sure you had that little bit of an edge. That's always, uh, that's always nice to know. Uh, I'm kind of surprised they're actually doing that. I understand the whole number fire thing, but I didn't expect that they were going to take it from different players, per se, at the same position. I know. It's, uh, it's challenging. It's a whole new... <laughs> it's a whole new way to try to evaluate the slate. Uh, I guess they're just trying to keep keep people interested and try new things. But uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun with our DFS Coach Talk challenges. So for our listeners who haven't uh, checked out the website yet, go take a look at DFSCoachTalk.com and you can pick up one of our memberships weekly, monthly, yearly, and that'll be on hold until we get MLB or NBA back up and running. And in the meantime, we have some fun contest with our members where we play some of these simulations. So uh, feel free to do that. Join join us. You'll get into our membership chat area called Discord where we post those uh, tournaments and uh, we give out some fun swag. So uh, that's a lot of fun. And in fact, tomorrow on tomorrow's show, we're going to have one of our members who won the most recent challenge uh, as a guest. Uh, he's going to make a guest appearance on the show with Coach and Santino. Yes, it would be a very exciting podcast to watch tomorrow. Absolutely. So, um, all right, well, that'll be tomorrow. Today we've got some work ahead of us involving the aforementioned Marlins and the Phillies, and we decided that we'll just we'll get the exciting Marlins out of the way first, and then we'll let Brett break down the Phillies. So, uh, Brett, I'll jump in on on the Marlins, and uh, and you can chime in whenever you'd like. So, Sounds good. Uh, let's start with the lineup because there is a, a bit of excitement at the top of the lineup. We've got Jonathan VR coming over from Baltimore and it looks like they're going to move him to the outfield. And he's one guy who, you know, is, is somebody that's a little bit enticing to actually play in DFS. That's going to be the challenge today as we break down the Marlins is, is finding guys we actually want to play. I mean, they went 57 and 105 last year just abysmal and uh they decided to bring Mattingly back as the manager for two more years even though his his record down in South Florida is 272 and 364 so they're just really right in the middle of that rebuild with Jeter making a lot of big trades um I'm not expecting big things but VR is somebody who you can consider at the top of the of the lineup he did steal 40 bags last year uh OPS just under 800, 24 home runs, um, priced at about 3,200 in these simulations. So he's worth a look. Uh, next in the lineup, uh, there's going to be some uncertainty here with some of these spots like two, seven, and eight in the batting order. But one guy who should be in the mix is Miguel Rojas, the shortstop. Really doesn't have much pop, though. Only five home runs last year in almost 500 at-bats. So I, I don't expect to play him at all. Next in the lineup, we've got Brian Anderson. He's a little bit more attractive because he did manage to hit 20 home runs last year and 33 doubles. And his season was cut short 35 games early with a hand injury. So he only got to 459 at-bats. So with a full season, he could push for closer to 30 home runs and, and 40 doubles. And he's priced pretty cheap. He's 2500 in these FanDuel simulations. So... Uh, he, he's a guy I would consider. Next, we've got the cleanup hitter, Jesus Aguilar. And he had a real disappointing season last year. Also cut short, only 314 at-bats, 12 home runs. And that's just not what we're looking for out of a big slugger like that who's got a much better history of, of home run power. Um, he's down at 2,200. Um, what do you think about him, Brett? Um, any any faith that he's going to return to his power numbers from earlier in his career? I was I I remember his earlier in his career where he was much more consistent power hitter. I'm hoping he returns because he he just he 
he's one of my like favorite hitters on the Marlins, if you will, because he's got a ton of pop and it's he can get on base, he can hit a double, he can, you know, clean up the bags. It's just it was frustrating watching him last year go through that huge slump and ended up having his season cut short. Uh, this year, I think he's looking for a fresh start, and I wouldn't be surprised if he made like a bounce back year, if you will. And uh, and I I would be excited to watch it. Uh, it he's definitely yeah, a good name too. to keep an eye on, and especially looking at this Marlins lineup, he's definitely one of the better names, if not the best name for in terms of power hitting. Um, so I would be on the lookout for his production this year. Uh, he's yeah. definitely one of those sleeper picks because. Let's be real. The Marlins are going to be one of those teams that are totally slept on. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it rolls this year. Yeah, no doubt. It was just back in 2018 when he hit 35 home runs for Milwaukee and got over 100 RBI. So, yeah, I agree. Let's let's keep an eye on him in the early season going. Hopefully, we'll get started here in uh, in June or July. And um, you know, if he shows some early power and they don't raise his price quick enough, that's somebody we can jump on. Next in the lineup is another guy who actually has some interest in. It's Corey Dickerson. And last year, he is the he's the only uh, Tampa Bay, sorry, uh, Miami regular who hit over 300. Now, that was in Pittsburgh and Philly. But uh, it's a guy, a new guy in the lineup who has some real potential. Because get this, he hit 12 home runs and 28 doubles. So he had 40 extra base hits in only 260 at-bats. And that's what gave him a 565 slugging percentage, which is the highest number on the Marlins from the regulars and their performance last year. So at 2,400, he's a value play on FanDuel that I could see myself investing in. I could see it too, honestly. Not quite as much for the next guy, catcher Jorge Alfaro. He did manage to hit 18 home runs last year in 431 at-bats, but... Not a very good on base, despite those 18 home runs. Not a very good slugging percentage. So he's a guy I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on. The next guy, all right, here's a potential diamond in the rough. And believe it or not, this is the most excited I am about any of these Marlins guys, just in terms of doing this research to get ready for this podcast, Brett. And it's <laughs> it's Lewis Brinson, and I just cannot believe the statistical overview on this guy. All right. Last year, he hit 173 with no home runs in 226 at-bats. So just an absolute zero in terms of power. But in the minor leagues, over an eight-year career, he hit 283 with 106 homers. And guess what he did this spring before the shutdown? He batted 345 with three home runs in only 29 at-bats. So this is a guy that is, I think, a, a GPP diamond in the rough. He's minimum price, and I'll, I'll play him a couple times in a GPP without without many expectations. But if he can get back in that groove that he was showing this spring, I mean, he's obviously got the power potential. He just hasn't shown it at the major league level. So I think he's a perfect candidate for a low-owned, cheap player who could surprise and really help you move up the standings in the GPP. Yeah, I agree with that, uh, especially with the way his spring was rolling. I could see him being one of those sleeper picks as long with Aguilar, you know, yeah. throw him in the GPP, and he's going to be low-owned. So, I mean, if he goes off, that's going to keep climbing. It's going to make you climb really high. Yeah, that'd be a nice little uh, sneaky stack there, Aguilar and Brinson. Uh I just I just can't remember the last time I saw a guy's major league stats and minor league stats so different. You know, get this. Last year's on base percentage was 236, career 352 in the minors. Slugging, he was 221 last year, and he was a career 499 in the minors. And then OPS, 457 last year, career 851. It's just like two different guys. And somebody oh, yeah. like that. You just need to get the confidence at the major league level. He obviously didn't have it yet, but that's what, you know, you, you see 345 with three home runs this spring, you know, it feels like maybe he turned the corner. You know, if they're telling him, hey, you're going to be our everyday guy in the outfield, um, out in center, or actually 
probably in right field, actually, if, if VR goes to center. But if they're telling him you're, you you got a chance to play every day here, then maybe that's just the confidence he needs. So uh, I can't wait to see how he starts off the season. Oh, it's going to be exciting to see how the two sleeper picks we have rolling. That's right. Up panning out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the eight hole, looks to me it's going to be Isan Diaz. And he had similar numbers to Brinson last year. He actually batted 173. He did manage five home runs, but uh, here's a guy that I just don't have as much faith in, so I, I'm not going to be playing him. I want to mention three guys off the bench. The old veteran Matt Joyce has come over from Atlanta, and he batted 295 last year on base of 408. Now, he only had 200 at-bats, but... This is a guy who certainly has the experience. You see him get a spot start um, at, at minimum price. He's a guy that you could consider. And then Garrett Cooper, first baseman outfield, he managed to hit 15 home runs last year, batted 281. Pretty good numbers for the Marlins. Um, so he, he wouldn't be the worst play ever. And I can then see Cooper being a position or a situational player you would want to play. Uh, Especially knowing that the Marlins could really change their lineup at any time right now, considering they they're still a team that's I guess you can consider tanking or if you will like not really pushing for the playoffs. I could definitely see Cooper sliding into the starting lineup here and there and being a possible valuable pick. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And and for those same reasons, that's why I was kind of surprised that they picked up Matt Joyce. I, I figure it's really. The only reason is because if they're not going to try to win, why do you want to get this guy who's actually a pretty good hitter? Uh, maybe it's just to have another veteran bat, another veteran hitter around to help, um, you know, teach these young guys some secrets and, and help them improve. Um, final guys, Harold Ramirez, a guy who could could make the roster. And as a rookie last year, he hit 11 home runs, knocked in 50, batted 276. Um no numbers that really jumped out. Just kind of a solid player. Keep an eye on. You know, it's pretty good. Pretty good power numbers for a rookie who didn't play a full season. But that pretty much wraps up the the hitters for the Marlins. I want to transition to the pitching staff and doing my best here to pick out some DFS advice for the for the starting pitchers. And I, and I think we have a couple nuggets that we can work with. So first off, looks like Sandy Alcantara is going to lead the rotation. And this guy is just the definition of a Marlins player. All right, Brett, so so get this. He was an all-star last year. And Correct. And he, he had two shutouts, so tied for the league lead there. And he was seventh in the league in innings pitched, 197. But he had 14 losses. He led the NL in losses with 14, and he was an all-star. I mean, is that not just the definition of the Marlins? Yeah, it's, it fits perfectly. He just wouldn't <laughs> expect that to happen. <laughs> oh, man. But he is cheap. I mean, in these simulations, he's only 6,300. So pretty good for an ace guy with an ERA under four. Doesn't have the best strikeout rate, only 6.9 per nine innings last year. So um, not, guy, not a guy I'm probably going to target. But if his price is that low, again, I don't, I don't think he's the worst play. The no. next guy, the next guy in the rotation, I think, is a little bit more attractive on a regular basis. It's Caleb Smith, uh, a left-hander whose nickname is Doctor K, and that's for good reason. Last year he had 9.9 Ks per nine innings, so uh, really uh, attractive number there. He managed to get 10 wins. ERA was 4.52, so not ideal. And the other thing is he's sort of the Jekyll and Hyde. He, he'll give you the strikeouts, but he also gives up the home runs. He gave up 1.9 per nine innings last year. So um, he's a guy that uh, really could go either way. I agree. All right, next guy in the rotation, uh, it seems to be a lock, is Pablo Lopez. And this is a guy I think we can attack with the opposing hitters. His ERA was over five last year. Just average numbers in terms of strikeouts. Didn't give up that many home runs. Um, decent whip. But 
Um, you know, he's a guy I think we can attack. The number four man, you know, this is, is still unsettled. They hadn't finalized the rotation when play was stopped. But Jose Urania uh, is looking to get back into the rotation. And he actually was the season opener. Um, he started the season opener the last two years. But last year, he had a back injury that really messed up his season. He ended up only making 13 starts. Didn't even get to didn't even get to 100 innings pitched. Um, whip was terrible. He he did have a nice spring this year with an ERA of only 1.29 in 14 innings. I was so going to point that out. Yeah, he did have a really decent spring concerning coming off of probably one of the more serious injuries coming with yeah. the back. So you think that 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 strong start to the spring is enough to get him back in the rotation? Concerning they don't have. I can, like from my perspective, I don't think they have many better options to <laughs> right. go with in the rotation. <laughs> yeah. So I could definitely see him sliding in at the four, the five, um, depending on where Yamamoto ends up. But I could definitely see him getting back in the rotation. Right, that'd be a bit of a shocker, wouldn't it? If to, to have a guy who was who started the season opener two years in a row, and then all of a sudden they have five guys who they like better than him the next year. So it's the Miami Marlins, anything could happen, really. <laughs> anything can happen. And they have been making a lot of trades and picking up these arms. They got Alcantara in the Marcel Ozuna trade. And um, and the next guy they got in the Yelich trade, that's Jordan Yamamoto. And he made his debut in June. And then he went on to, to start 15 games, went four and five. His ERA was 4.46, but his whip was 1.14. And he picked up some strikeouts, 9.4 per nine innings. So here's a – if he ends up being the fifth starter, he's a guy that I don't think you want to attack like a, a traditional fifth starter on a terrible team. I think this guy's got some potential. Um, so I, I'd much rather go after a guy like Lopez than Yamamoto. Um, as for the bullpen, they did pick up Brandon Kinsler from the Cubs – he had a 2.68 ERA last year, only one save. But back in 16 and 17, he averaged 23 saves per season with Minnesota. So it looks like he's going to get the job as the closer. Uh, those were some of the highlights that I found, Brett, as preparing to break down the pitching staff for the Marlins. Any other thoughts on those guys? Uh, it's a lot of young arms on that rotation and uh, especially with Yamamoto coming up and this is is this his first full year if I remember correctly yeah the, exactly it, it's going to be interesting to see how the rotation and whether Yamamoto is going to move up and down or if they're going to stick with the Al- Alcantara and Caleb Smith as the one two and keep three through five rotating but it, it'll be Interesting to see how it pans out. I, I really hope Yamamoto ends up staying because he's got a lot of potential from what we saw last year, and I think it would be huge in terms of keeping the starting rotation consistent, and uh, I, uh, it would be great. Yeah, definitely. I mean, these guys, you got to figure overall with, with those guys that you described and, and the hitters as well, it's just a, it's a season of maturing and growing and, and getting more experience and more success um we really can't expect a very successful season overall but i do think we've got some opportunity to gain an edge uh if we look at some of those guys that we that we described but let's transition to the phillies because you've got a bunch of guys in that lineup that are much more experienced and successful and attractive on a on a daily basis that's for sure um First thing I want to point out is Gabe Kapler got fired this off season um, due to not uh, meeting expectations with the current roster and the roster they had last year, um, which led to a honestly a great signing, Joe Girardi. Um, I really think he's going to push this roster forward. Um, I think his veteran leadership, he knows how to take control of the clubhouse. He knows how to function uh unlike Gabe Kapler but um I, I it would be great to see what a veteran leader a veteran manager can do with this roster because I, I believe personally it has a lot of potential um they do have some really great offseason signings and Didi Gregorius um and that 
is they're going to have a solid shortstop player and they're not going to have to keep moving Scott Kingery around like they did last year. Um, so the projected batting lineup for the Philadelphia Phillies is at number one, uh, Andrew McCutcheon at left field. Number two, we're going to have Didi at shortstop. Number three is going to be Bryce Harper. Cleanup is going to be Reese Hoskins. Number five is JT Real Muto. Number six is Gene Segura. Number seven, Scott Kingry. Number eight, uh, it's one of those positions, center field. Uh, it's really between Scott Kingry and Adam Hazley. They're going to be moving around the outfield, um, depending on how they want to how they want to situate the outfield. Uh, but as of right now, I have Adam Hazley playing at center field and Scott Kingry playing third base. That's my projected lineup. So I do like this lineup a lot. Uh, it's, it's better than where they were um, last year and the year before. Uh, so number one, we have Andrew McCutcheon, uh, a great solid veteran. His season was cut short due to an ACL injury. He had a knee injury. Um, and during those games, he had 219 plate appearances uh, 10 home runs, and he was hitting 256. It's pretty decent. Um, he's definitely one of those players, uh, if the salary's right, you can definitely count on him. But I wouldn't necessarily be looking at him uh, every Philadelphia slate, necessarily. Um, his value is, in the MLB simulations, he is 3,500. Um and when you take that into consideration with Bryce Harper being 3,800, I would definitely go with Bryce Harper. Um, yeah, me too. But you got to figure McCutcheon, um, you think he's going to get back to his previous form? Because this is a guy who always hit 20 home runs. If you give him a full – I mean, he was at 10 home runs in 59 games. I, right. I definitely, if he had a full season, I, I for sure could see him having a 20-25 home run season with around – I, I say like 70, 80 RBIs. I yeah, because if he's going to be leading off, he probably won't get as many RBI. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the power he, coming he back. Can definitely, he can definitely put the ball over the fence and hit the gaps for sure. And I, I definitely can see him being a huge help in the outfield when he comes back because the whole situation was a nightmare last year. Um, number two, I believe I said Didi. Um, Didi is, is an interesting signing. Um I agree. While I agree with it, it's it was weird that the Yankees didn't offer him anything per se. Um, but he is going to be a solid. It's going to be a lot of help for Philadelphia, considering now they have a firm shortstop and they can keep Gene Segura either at second or third base. Um, this signing's great, even though I do believe Didi's season was cut short last year. If I recall correctly, he had an injury. I'm trying yeah, to he only that. got yeah he only got 324 at bats. Yeah, he had an injury. Uh, he had a shoulder injury um, that was bothering him. And but besides that, I do I do really think that he's gonna contribute great to the Philadelphia lineup, um, especially playing under Joe Girardi. He already has experience with him. Yeah, what was that? Was that a package goes. deal? They all, all the Yankees I, coming over together? I, it seems like <laughs> it. I, I feel like you know whatever the Yankees don't want, Joe Girardi's gonna pick them up. So <laughs> it's just how it works. Uh, but over 82 games, he did bat 238, which wasn't the greatest, but he still put 16 over the fence, and he did have 61 RBIs. So I mean, take that into consideration of only playing 82 games. If he had a full season. I would definitely say that's that would be a great season and a half. Um, at number three, I, Bryce Harper. Um, not gonna lie, I, I think he had a little bit of a underwhelming season last year. Uh, only batting 260, he did put 35 home runs over the. He did have 35 home runs and 114 RBIs, so it wasn't that underwhelming. Um, I, I was definitely expecting him to be closer to a 300 average. Would you expect that? Yeah, um, career 276 hitter. Um, it is two years in a row with with down numbers in terms of batting average. 
Yeah, but um, he definitely he's definitely still putting he definitely still has the power as we can see with the thirty five home runs and the, the one hundred fourteen RBIs he has, as well as the thirty six doubles. Um, I I would I definitely think he's a he's gonna have a little bit better of a year. I, maybe it's just a different atmosphere he's playing in, and you know Philadelphia fans can be pretty brutal if I say so myself. <laughs> Um, have you I, ever I, boo- have you ever booed Bryce Harper? Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> really? When I first when we first started, I, I remember he was in like a slump, and oh man, at Citizens Bank Park they were just ripping into him. It was it was crazy, but he did end up coming back. You know, of course he came back to hit you know 35 home runs, and, and everyone enjoyed him after that. But I, I do gotta say one thing about Bryce Harper is he just has nonstop hustle, and and. The way he plays the outfield, it's always fun to watch a ball hit his way because you know he's always going to give it 110% when he goes after it, which is always fun to watch. It's more better to see someone diving after a ball and uh, just letting it drop. But uh, with the simulation salary at 3800 he definitely is It's a respectable price. Um, with the studs on the lineup, uh, the studs on the slate, uh, I, I, I could very well – if it's you don't want to go after like Mike Trout or Christian Yelich or a couple hundred more, I do have to say Bryce Harper is a very valuable pick at 3,800 because he does have the potential to home run and uh, maybe a nut like a two or two home runs a game. I mean, it has happened before where I remember last year he there was multiple times where he would break the slates because if you didn't have him when he hit a home run or two, it, it it was just game over. But um, yeah, how do you feel about yeah. Bryce Harper? Well, the other thing, first of all, I love the, what you talked about with his hustle. And I would think that Philly would appreciate that. The, first of all, he always comes to play. He's only missed eight games in the last two years. So sure. he's he's always in the lineup. He's always playing hard. He's getting you 35 homers. And, yeah, the batting average down a little bit. But he gets so many walks that his on-base percentage is still good. So, I agree. I mean, I, yeah, I just a tad under 400 for the on-base percentage. It was right. pretty good. Um, the next player, Reese Hoskins. Reese Hoskins had a really good start to last season, and then he ended up falling off. Um, you remember that last year? Yeah, I remember. You know, just all the hype with him coming up here these last couple years, and and then yeah, he's getting off to a big power surge. And then not ending up with the numbers that we would have hoped for. No, he and he his batting average was 226, which is extremely low, considering he has the potential to be one of the best hitters in the lineup. Um, he did hit 30, 29 home runs and he did have 85 RBIs, but with all the hype coming into this year, I for sure thought he was going to have at least a maybe a 270 batting average and put a couple more over the fence. But I, I definitely could see him bouncing back this year. Uh, there's new manager, new, I believe they got a whole new staff rolling in with Joe Girardi. Um, they got a new hidden coach and I know they definitely needed a new pitching coach, but uh, Reese Hoskins is definitely one of the players you might want to keep an eye out considering how his salary might play out. Um, trying to Pull it up right now. Well, yeah, he's, right now he's at 3,300. And the other stat I want to throw in, we talked about the walks with Harper. Hoskins had 116 walks last year. He led the led the NL in walks. Yeah. And so, again, batting average a little bit lower, but at least he's giving you a bunch of those walks. That's true. And one of the, the, one of the funny stats on the team is Bryce Harper and Reese Hoskins' strikeouts. They're only five off. There's only five – uh, strikeout difference. Bryce Harper leads the team with 178 strikeouts, while Reese Hoskins is sitting at 173, which is kind of funny. <laughs> That's kind but, of a lot. <laughs> uh, it's, lots lots just, of strikeouts I, and walks from those guys. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, their uh, his on base percentage for Reese Hoskins was 364. Uh, he was right behind Bryce Harper, but uh, definitely I would if his average picks up, I would definitely consider him at 3300. For first base, because on FanDuel at least, you have the option to take a catcher or first base, and I would definitely, definitely throw him in there, or maybe throw him in the utility spot if you're gonna play a good catcher like Grandel or JT, which is a different topic. But uh, 
yeah, I, I'm definitely I'm excited to see what Reese does this year because this is a huge uh, turning around season for him. Um, it, I I definitely feel like he's hungry and he's definitely got something to prove to himself. So, um, that's how I feel. Um, next after Reese, we have JT Real Muto. Awesome catcher. He's really great defensively. Uh, he he did pretty well uh, for for the expectations I had for him. Batted 275 on base percentage, 328. Did hit 25 home runs and 83 RBIs. Pretty solid numbers for being a catcher. Um, I he's one of those catchers where I feel like if his price is right, because I remember last year he was in the 2000s and I was kind of a bit of a surprised by it because he definitely has the power and he definitely can, you know, do some damage for your lineup uh, without a doubt. And um, I, I think, I think he's going to be another, he's another uh, good look that I'd have. So, I mean, he's from the top three players from this lineup. What I'm getting to is definitely JT Reese and Bryce Harper. Those are the three main guys you probably are going to target most of the time from Philadelphia with maybe a little dab of Andrew McCutcheon and DD here and there. But um. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, the thing about Rio Muto is as you described, if he ends up batting fifth and last year he batted fifth 82 times. So that was the place they, they, they slotted him the most. Then he's going to be able to take advantage of uh, opposing pitchers. If they walk Harper, and or Hoskins, then he's going to get the chance to have his home run be a three-run homer and, and knock some guys in. Oh, for sure. It's going to boost his RBI. For definitely, RBI is definitely going to be higher if he's batting behind the cleanup, which I, I think it's great. I don't know why what they were doing last year. They, I remember they were batting him two last year for some Yeah, reason. 29 times he batted second. Yeah, and I, I just... I'm not a fan of what Gabe Kapler was doing last year because I think consistency is definitely better than having randomizations throughout the lineup. I agree. Trying to adapt. Uh, the next guy I have on the list is – we already talked about DD. So yeah. let's do Segura. Gene Segura. Yep. So Gene Segura, um, last year uh, he, he did pretty well. I I say so. He he was batting over 300 most of the year, and then he ended ended at 280. Uh, he's a real nice. He's really nice. Um, he yeah, he had 12 home runs, 60 RBIs. Um, on base percentage was 322. Um, he's walked 30 times. Uh, he 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 was a nice veteran presence for the team, considering that Philadelphia is a fairly young team, and they still are. Um, so I remember when he was coming over, he he was another like corning stone that they were relying on, and uh, I definitely could see him fitting in well, and uh, and he has so far. For Fandle wise, nah, I'm not necessarily too keen on him. Um, maybe here and there, but he's definitely a solid player to be in the Philadelphia lineup. Yeah, and you're right. He he finished cold there last September and October last year. He only batted 238. Yeah. So let's hope that he's uh gets off to a better start this year. Let's, yeah, let's just hope uh like maybe hope like this year that he finished consistent at least because he was been solid over 300 for most of the season, which was great. So um and he did have he was second on the team in hits. He had 161 behind Cesar Hernandez, who's unfortunately no longer on the team. Uh, I think they let him go as an unrestricted free agent. I'm pretty sure he got picked up. Um, yeah, he's with the. I think he's with the Indians now. Yeah, he's with. Yeah. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they fill the void, considering he had 171 hits last year. But uh, another another great name in Philadelphia, Scott Kingery, um, came up. They were throwing him around everywhere. I remember he was playing third, short, second, and then they were putting him everywhere in the outfield. Uh, he did go on some streaks last year, I remember. He he definitely had some really good runs last year. Batted 258, had 315 on base percentage, 
34 walks, uh, 19 home runs, 55 RBIs, and he only played 126 games. Um, he's a really nice sleep. He's like a he's one of my GPP sleepers. Uh, not a lot of people are going to look at him, and he does have the chance to have a really good game because I know there were multiple games last year where he went, he played really well and scoring above 20, 30 FanDuel points. Uh, or in Philly's darkest times, but uh, <laughs> that's just how it works sometimes. Um, and then yeah, the he's final... got some he's got some pop for a guy who's down in the order, cheap, because he also hit what was it, thirty four doubles last year. Oh yeah, he yeah. he's definitely he's for the bottom of the lineup. He definitely has some pop. I mean, if you're trying to fill in a role, uh, like if you have like a cheap, you only have like you know maybe like three thousand left, and he's under three thousand, he's definitely a solid pick. Considering he has a lot of pop, uh, he's also, I believe, a switch hitter too. If I'm correct. I think, he's, then, I think he's just a righty. He's just a righty. Yeah. Okay. Must be mixing him up with Brad Miller, who's no longer on the team anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, he's he's a great solid bottom of the lineup pick. Uh, I really I really enjoy watching him play. He's a fun guy to watch. And uh, with a final hitter, I have Ad- Adam Hazley starting. Adam Hazley only played 67 games last year. Um, not he doesn't have a lot of pop, but he did hit 266 with a 324 on base percentage. Um, he had six home run or five home runs, 14 doubles, 26 RBIs, as well as 14 walks. Um, not necessarily a huge, you know, power hitter, but um, I, I feel like it would. I think, I wouldn't really play him at all, but I, I feel like he's more there for the defensive to be uh, in the outfield, to have someone be consistent out there. Um, and then um, I got to I got to mention, Brett, that that description was excellent for Hazley, but it pains me because we share the same birthday. And so I was hoping really? for a, a, little, a little more power out of this guy, but he just doesn't have it. So uh, as much as I want to play him as the birthday brother, I just I just can't. It's unfortunate. Maybe, yeah. uh, maybe he, you know, he'll take some steroids. You know, <laughs> just kidding. But, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, with the full season, we could see what his actual full potential is, and I, I'm really kind of curious because he is—he's only 23. So, right. I mean, he's, if he pans out well, I mean, he's got a full career ahead of himself, and he's definitely—he is one of the—I think he is the youngest player on the and my current starting lineup. Uh, right. He's 23, and he's. Uh, he's three years younger from the next guy, which is Scott Kingry. Um, I mean, it's, it, it'd be inter- interesting to see how it pan out. Uh, meaning, coming off the bench, I mean, for me, it isn't, there's only one name that sticks out. Um, Jay Bruce. Uh, Jay Bruce did have some good moments. Uh, he only played 51 games, so he was more of a situation player. Uh, remember when they traded for him off the Marlins? They only... They said they're only going to use him in situations. Um, batted 221, 235 on base percentage. Hit 12 home runs, had 31 RBIs. Um, it, it's funny because 30, he had 32 hits and 12 of them were home runs. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't mess around. No, no. I mean, he either <laughs> hits a home run or uh, it's a single, I guess. But because uh, he's not really fast, but. Uh, that's basically the only thing that catches my eye off the bench for this team. I really wouldn't play him. I mean, if you want to you really want to go super GPP, I mean, you could throw Jay Bruce in and hopefully you pray for the best. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's my that's my comments uh, and how I feel about the Philadelphia 2020 lineup. Uh, is there anything you would like to add, Andrew? No, I'm with you. That's a great breakdown. Um, I think I would add in on Jay Bruce. Um that those those numbers you gave were in Philly, and his totals last year after coming over from Seattle were uh, 26 home runs in only 310 at bats. So I, I do like him as a he gets a spot start, uh, pretty cheap price. I play him and hope for a home run because we know that's what his mission is when he steps into that plate. He's dipping and jacking. So, oh yeah. Um, I mean that's a great ratio. Uh, and we know how home, how important home runs are in fantasy. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I like that. I like that you mentioned him coming off the bench uh, as a potential power guy. 
Oh, I meant, I forgot to mention one other player. It's Philadelphia's top prospect that we might be seeing this year. Uh, Alec Bohm. Possibly could see him this year. He possibly could be called up. Uh, he was a first-round pick in the 2018 draft. He's 23, and he was born a week before me. He's August 3rd. I'm August 10th. It's funny. Um, he is a really solid uh, prospect for Philadelphia. Uh, I could see him. He hit uh, 14, 18, 21, 23 home runs last year uh, in the minor leagues. And he had a really solid batting average. He batted. 269 in Redding, 329 in Clearwater, and in Lakewood, he batted 367. So that's single A, A plus, and double A. Uh, so he's a really solid minor league prospect um, to fill in a void. Uh, for instance, let's say they want to move him to the third base and kick Scott Kingry out to the outfield, or, you know, if they, if they really want to have some wiggle room within their depth in their lineup, they, I could definitely see him being called up. For a certain amount of time, but I, I would hope Philadelphia would keep him in the minors, let him develop more, because he does have a potential to be a really good power hitter for the Philadelphia lineup in the near future. Yeah, that's a great name to to be on top of. One thing I love about his development is that in 2018 he didn't hit any home runs. Oh yeah. Uh, cool. in in 139 at bats, so uh, you know he he got he got serious with his training with the wood bat after that and, and hit 21, like you mentioned last year. So yeah, we'll have to be ready to, to plug him in the lineup whenever he gets up there. For sure. And um, I, I'm excited because I don't remember the last time Philadelphia had a really strong, solid prospect to come up. Uh, besides Nola, of course, Nola has been great, but I, anyone else, I, Dominic Brown was hyped up and then he's not even in a league anymore. But I, I hope Alec Bohm produces when he comes up and stays in Philadelphia. I'm sure the fans would love it. Um, yeah, no doubt. Well, you mentioned Nola. Is he at the top of your your list? And when you when you want to start breaking down the pitching staff? Yes. So I might get some slack for it, but even though they signed Zach Wheeler, I do believe Nola will be the number one guy. Um, I think having Zach Wheeler behind him is great. It improves their starting rotation tremendously. So I wanted to point something out. So the projected 2020 rotation is Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, Jake Arrieta, Vincent Valesquez, and Zach Eflin. This is the rotation from last year. Aaron Nola, Zach Eflin, Jake Arrieta, Vince Valesquez, Drew Smiley, Jason Vargas. And they also had Nick Pavetta start a couple times. So you can already see they're trying to dial in the rotation a lot more this year, which is great. Um, I, I definitely think this rotation is 10 times better. Uh, from, a D, from a DFS perspective, I do think your main go-to guys, if you are going to play Philadelphia, is Zach Wheeler and Alan Noah. Um, I believe in the simulations right now, Zach Wheeler is 9000 Aaron Nola is right around that price point. Um, those are great, solid, uh, not necessarily mid-tier, but they are not at the top. Uh, they're not the 10,000, 11,000 guys. They're, they are solid uh, pitch pitchers to have. Uh, let me uh, For Nola last year, at least, I, I know he, he had 229 strikeouts um, in, I believe, 34 starts, which is pretty solid. Um, that's I think 10.2 per nine. Yeah. Um, that's, that's that's money right there. That is money from a DFS perspective. Uh, he, I, he he's definitely one of my favorite pitchers to target this year. Uh, his home run per nine is 1.2. His WHIP is 1.265. So th- these are really solid numbers. So if he gets the bats behind him, I, I definitely think he could win a lot more games this year. Uh, his ERA was kind of high. It was 3.87. But I, I definitely could see that going down this year as he continues to develop as he is 26. So I could see him, you know, having progressively getting better into his um, late more later into his career. Next guy is Zach Wheeler. 
I a lot of people were a little skeptic on the signing. Um, Zach Wheeler did have an up and down season last year. Uh, finished eleven and eight. ERA was three point nine six. Uh, he started thirty one games. He did have one hundred and ninety five strikeouts, which is really good. Um, strikeouts per nine is nine. His home run per nine is one. Uh, he did. He had two point three walks per nine. Not bad. Um, he did give up twenty two home runs though, which can hurt if you considering he only started thirty one games. It can hurt if you get one of his bad starts. Uh, no fun seeing your pitcher give up home runs and seeing the points being deducted away after he has so many strikeouts. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, especially if you're paying nine thousand and more for him. Exactly, and uh, those are my two top picks. I mean, um, Jake Arrieta, it's he's okay. Uh, he had he went eight and eight last year, twenty four games started. He did have an elbow injury, so his season was kind of cut short, which was part of the reason why Philadelphia had rotation issues because they weren't able to have consistent pitchers besides Nola. And Eflin and Valesquez got an injury last year, too. So, I mean, they were just rolling through pitchers, which was unfortunate. But uh, Arietta, it's, it's not he's not one of my top guys. Um, could I could see you starting him if he's like a mid-tier pitcher. If he was like six 7,000, I, I do think he has the ceiling to do well. But I, I don't think he's the same player as he was from Chicago. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, just uh... – the big name who, you know, just hasn't produced like like you would have hoped. Yeah, especially in Philadelphia. I mean, when they signed him, they were hoping he would really boost the boost how the uh, the rotation is, you know, get them further into the games, but has not worked out. Uh, I do want to mention that their closer is probably going to be Hector Nurse again, like it was last year. Uh, it's not the greatest, not the worst. Um, their bullpen, it's, it's non-existent. Really haven't signed anyone. Um, they do have Adam Morgan, and uh, that's Adam Morgan, and David Robinson's coming back. So it'll be interesting to see how he comes back off an injury. Um, but otherwise, it's not really a deep bullpen, uh, not anything really special. So uh, that's all I really got to say about that. Yeah, well, I like the, um, the the general description you had there of the. The, the starting rotation and what I took away from it was you get rid of Drew Smiley and you bring in Zach Wheeler and I like that trade I know it cost them a lot in trade in terms of the swap in the rotation not that they were traded for each other but and, and I know it costs a lot of money to do that but we talked on we, we talked about Drew Smiley on an earlier podcast because uh, of of his home run numbers he gave up 2.5 homers per nine last year and his ERA was over six. So you get that guy off your rotation, you bring in Zach Wheeler. Uh, I'll take that swap any day, even though it does cost, uh, what? $100 million. $21.5 20, this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Joe Girardi, being a former catcher, is going to be a little bit more excited about their rotation. Yeah, I, I think for sure JT Real Muto was looking forward to having Joe Girardi as his coach. <laughs> so like both can go through the pain when the rotation doesn't live up to its expectation. But you never know. I mean, maybe they'll have a comeback year. I'm really hoping that the rotation's firm this year. They don't have as many injuries as they did last year, which it was brutal for Philadelphia last year. And I, I, I'm hoping that this year they are able to find some consistency and be able to actually not win games and not blow leads. Because that was a huge thing last year was blowing leads with them. So we'll see how it ends up. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And that was a great breakdown, Brett. Why don't you let our listeners know where they can find you on Twitter? All right. You guys can find me at Deffy underscore DFS. It's D-E-A-F-Y underscore DFS. You can also find us at DFS Coach Talk, which is at DFS Coach Talk on Twitter. And Andrew, what's your at, at handle? I am at Language Olympic. So uh, we'd love if you would give us a follow and a thumbs up. Wherever you're listening to this podcast, that would be excellent. And we greatly uh, appreciate it. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, Brett, um, I'm going to 
flip the script to the NBA one more time because as we wrap up this podcast, all I can think about is 9 o'clock Eastern tonight, The Last Dance, the documentary with the Bulls and Michael Jordan from 98. Are you going to be tuned in? I am definitely going to be tuned in. Uh, it's going to be – I'm really excited to look forward to it. Uh, it's one of those podcasts that – or one of these shows, if you will, that I've been looking forward to come up because everything's dry on TV right now. I mean, <laughs> we're all sitting at home, so – it would be nice to see something different, and I'm excited to see what the documentary has to portray of the 98 Bulls with Michael Jordan. Seriously. I, I read an article uh, yesterday on ESPN.com about it, and I got chills just reading the documentary. I mean, just reading the article about the documentary. They were talking about how – I think it was Ramona Shelburne who wrote it – talking about how it was so difficult to convince Michael Jordan to – agree to you know releasing this footage and how they taped it they got most of the footage way back in 98 and it just sat in the vault oh Uh, yeah and so it was a big negotiation just to get jordan to agree to release it and he had full autonomy full power to make that decision so he's really giving us all a gift here in this uh downtime for sports to be able to reminisce about one of the greatest dynasties in the history of sports Oh, for sure. And uh, I'm super excited to watch it, uh, especially since it's been put away for so long. I mean, it's it's really going to be a gift for us and it's going to be a nice treat to have. Absolutely. Well, uh, that's going to do it for us today. Uh, do make sure make sure to tune in again tomorrow to DFS Coach Talk as Coach and Santino are going to break down the Mets and the Nationals. And as I mentioned, they're going to have one of our members on to discuss his dominant run through the DFS Coach Talk Challenge. Um, so so make sure to tune in for that. It'll be a fun episode. And uh, thank you again, Brett. Excellent job today. Really enjoyed doing it with you. We'll have to do it again soon. So on behalf of Brett Trimble, I am Andrew Hansen. Thank you for tuning in and be sure to tune in again tomorrow for another episode of DFS Coach Talk. Have a good one.